So thank you for showing up, especially at uh, this part of the term. So the University of Alberta respectfully acknowledges that we're located on Treaty 6 territory, a traditional gathering place for diverse Indigenous peoples, including the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Ojibwe, Saltu, Anishinaabe, Inuit, and many others whose histories, languages, and cultures continue to influence our vibrant community. Today, we're going to talk about a paradigm-shifting pedagogy, the stressful approach to a curricula. And this dates back to my first week of teaching when I encountered a distraught, weeping student who was quite upset. This was almost 23 years ago. And that experience, unfortunately, has repeated itself over the years of my teaching. And it was probably best described about 10 years ago when I had a student who pointed out that university is so stressful because she went to a class, her first class, first year in university. And in the class, the professor said, look to your left, look to your right. Two of you will not survive this program. Only one of you will make it through. So she was felt really stressed. A lot of pressure was on her. And then she went to open up her phone, she said, and she got a whole different message. And that message was from the U of A, we care for your mental health. She, she was very confused by all of this. And we had to discuss this and contend with this because it is true that the university stresses us out. That's one of the things that the university does. It's a part of taking on assignments and tasks and facing new challenges. We'll experience some stress. And whether you're a professor or a student, you'll experience a lot of pressures, like the time pressure. And today, when I go through these points, I'm going to try to get you to have some empathy for students and hopefully students, if they ever encounter this type of information, have empathy for professors as well. Because whether you're a student or prof, you have a pressure sometimes with time and space. Sometimes you just don't have space for things. For some, it's money. For others, it might be a stigma. So the student who uh, was crying on the first week of uh, classes, she felt very alone uh, with her problem, which is partly why she was crying. She thought everybody else had it together. And so one year I did a, a survey in the class. I asked people to write, uh, so just a reflective writing survey, just write about how stressed they were at that part of the term. And everyone started writing, and then I asked them to close their eyes and put up their hands if they admitted to feeling stressed. And then I asked them to open their eyes and look around. And the class was shocked to see that everybody was stressed out. They were sh genuinely shocked. They looked at each other like, I thought you had it together. No, I thought you were all, all together with everything. And then they, they were pointing out each other and shocked that each other uh, had these issues. So there was a stigma. They felt very alone. And it was kind of weird that they felt alone because we, we encounter stress quite a bit. But they had this false perception of themselves and others. Sometimes professors get this. So, you know, you get your fancy PhD after years of research, and then you feel vulnerable when you have to go and teach because you might not have done a lot of teaching or you feel as though you focused on research and now you got to develop a new skill almost from scratch because there's not a lot of formal training in that area. And I've ex encountered these three things throughout my uh, experience as a student and my experience as a professor. So those three things are a fixed mindset, linear thinking, and a fragmented experience. An experience sort of like I'm walking down campus, I remember as a student, and I'd see all these resources and all these areas that could, uh, institutions that could help us at the university, but I didn't really access them. I didn't know if I, how I could get in there. I was unwilling to make the first step. And as a professor, I noticed this too, that sometimes I slip into the fixed mindset or linear thinking, and I also have a fragmented experience. So what the stressful approach encourages is that we challenge the fixed mindset, shift away from a linear model, and make the fragmented siloed campus experience into a closer, more integrated community through changes to the curricula itself, to the syllabus, the calendar, and if you want, you can get the department involved too. The first paradigm shift is moving from a fixed to a growth mindset. And to understand a fixed and growth mindset, we got to go to the world wrestling of mindsets. Now, the world wrestling of mindsets is a big civil war between the fixed mindset and the gross mindset. And these mindsets are constantly in conflict with one another, and they're promoted by a very famous wrestling promoter, Carol Dweck. Carol Dweck also dabbles a little in psychology, and she became very uh, well-known 
for popular, pop, popularizing the notion of neuroplasticity. Now, neuroplasticity counters a notion about the brain that we used to have. See, the old view was toddlers develop brains, and then our brains just sort of deteriorated as we got older. The new view is no, we all have this neuroplasticity so long as we continue stimulating and learning and developing ourselves. Now, the fixed mindset is kind of like the wrestler who is the if you don't know a pro professional wrestling, it doesn't matter. But it's about the wrestler who has the belt, he likes the bling, wears a crown, shows off quite a bit because he's very insecure. He believes that being a champion is something innate, that your talent, your intellect, they're all innate. So he avoids challenges, doesn't like constructive feedback, doesn't like making any effort, gives up easily. He's very insecure. And that view is in conflict with the other wrestler, the growth mindset wrestler who's okay with hurdles and feedback and hard work because he thinks that your talent and your intellect can be developed as you work hard. So he's not afraid of such hard work because you're always growing and learning. And that is what neuroplasticity reminds us of. So the growth mindset is very important for us to address if we're going to adopt a sort of stressful approach to things. The other thing is this linear thinking. So I sometimes catch myself doing this linear thinking, and I catch my students doing this. Sometimes I catch other professors talking this way. But it's a type of thinking, it's almost like a fantasy fairy tale thinking, that you have a goal. Once you reach that goal, you're like, done, no more work to do. Life is easy now. I can live happily ever after. But this is problematic because you won't live happily ever after. I don't want to be depressing. That's not the point. The point is, we constantly have challenges. We, we finish a stage, we achieve something, there'll be another goal, there'll be another challenge, there'll be another stress for us to deal with. Having a linear thinking will fool you into thinking everything will be fine if you just do this one thing and finish this one task. So like finish teaching this course or finish taking this course. And you think afterwards, everything will be fine. And that fools us into thinking, well, if everything will be fine, when you face a challenge, you're extra stressed out about it. So a better model we can find from Joseph Campbell and the hero cycle. So I'm adapting his model. If you don't know the, the hero cycle, it's a, a model that Joseph Campbell uses in literature and people adapt it to film in order to make sense of the hero's journey, the hero's quest. And so a popular film like this would be Star Wars A New Hope. Luke Skywalker, back in 1977, he is thrust from his family farm and he has to go out and answer the call to adventure. And then when he does this, he's separated from his family through the call to adventure. He goes into the next film, The Empire Strikes Back, and he experiences a crisis or a death of some sort. Now, death in quotes. It's not always a death. It's called a death because in ancient epics, heroes would go in ancient Greece to trips to Hades, where they'd meet ancestors or important people, and they'd learn from that. Uh, in contemporary times, it can be like a betrayal. So the story of Braveheart shows a, shows a betrayal. And then in Parodies like Princess Bride, they show that the hero becomes only mostly dead before returning. So Luke goes and the Emperor strikes back. He's wounded, loses his hand, and he also experiences an emotional shock. But when he returns, he's capable of facing the challenge he once wasn't capable of facing. And that hero cycle can be simplified to this, separation, initiation, and return. And I find it very helpful for applying it to psychology and to stress because we all have calls to adventure to answer you have to get up and do something you have to teach a new course you have to have a certain goal you need to achieve or a deadline you need to meet whatever it is you have to face that challenge but facing a challenge is not easy it's way easier to just procrastinate be lazy give up so you don't want to answer the call but you have to when you answer the call things may be tough and knowing that can be very helpful because it's realistic. You endure the trials and tests. There may be actual tests for students. For profs, you need to design fair tests, and that can be a, a pressure. But if you persevere, and the key is that if you face your fears, you're al already winning because you move out of your comfort zone. You're developing. You're grow growing. So you take on that test. You face that exam. You write that essay, or you mark all those test exams and essays. And it may be painful. You may have died a little. You know, that happens to me whenever I mark a stack of papers, but I face the challenge. And if you face the challenge and learn, you return wiser. And then our brain might think, uh oh, good, we're done. That's it. There's no more. But no, 
this is the fun part of this. It's that this cycle happens again and again and again. And that's not a problem because it's a healthy shift in our worldview towards stress and towards development, especially if it's a healthy type of stress. And the third part is that a hero's journey never occurs alone. Whether you're a student or a professor, a hero's journey always has helpers, animal friends and guides, sidekicks and sorcerers, wise women and wizards. There's lots of magical helpers for students and professors here at the University of Alberta. And it's important to access these resources or integrate them as part of your course or your syllabus or your calendar, because a community that cares, a community that that functions as a support network, is a community that helps everyone handle stress better, better. There's a lot of great research on this, that good, strong social network of support helps everyone cope with stress better. So you can make your syllabi work against stress. So your traditional stress, sorry, traditional syllabus is focused on the course. The calendar is focused on assignments and tests or stressors. So the document can come across as very isolated and isolating. Isolated because it's not connecting to all the other resources or uh, emotions and feelings and, and avenues of that can help a student address these assignments and tests. And isolating because it can make students feel like they're the only one who feels stressed out about these upcoming assignments and tests. But if you make a more stressable-oriented syllabus, you overcome the obstacles of a lack of time, space, and money, and too much stigma because you address the stress within the class itself. You work in a day or more in order to address some of the stresses that students face. So you build a curriculum that integrates university resources. You connect to campus events. Even if it's just one single reminder in your course calendar that anxiety dogs are on campus during exam week, that can make a big difference. And in your teaching, you can share your own stories of stress management, advice, lessons, of when you move through the very course you're teaching or your field or assignments and tasks that are similar that you faced as as a student. Sharing that can help connect with students and help them understand that you're not some super expert that does everything flawlessly, and that they, going through their stresses of handling assignments, is a normal process. Now, what we did was we had a whole week that we scheduled before each reading week, where we'd set up visits and potlucks and workshops. And that week, we just set aside and designed in our calendars for stressful type of events. Now, one example would be like the visit of the sexual assault center. So I was talking about feminism and gender issues, and I thought, how can I connect it to some other organization on campus that will help connect the material that we're covering to some real world or outside of the classroom issues? So the sexual assault center came and and gave a talk, and students really responded well to that because it was integrated with the curriculum itself. And Throughout the semester, if you have capacity, you can you can remind students have a workshop on beatdown procrastination. You can do it in the class, or you can do it with uh, cooperation with some academic help center. We've had career center visits and come and show how our courses can link up to employable skills. Sometimes we just had stations set up at the library or at the academic help center at Campus Saint Jean La Centrale, where people could make cards or do coloring against stress. Jose Willette, the CSJ counselor, came one time and had students just smacking clay for 15 minutes. And students became revitalized by that activity. Even though it took 15 minutes away from the class, it got students to just de-stress, do something tactile, and understand that they don't have to always be in their heads, that they can gain some sort of revitalization by going into their bodies or doing something distracting and, and playful for a while. You can also build assignments. I've done this. I've asked students to go to a campus resource, go to events, and made it a part of an assignment for marks or for bonus marks. We have also have panels. So you can have panels about uh, that you can build into assignments within the course. So about transitioning from high school to university, that's a great discussion to have with students, especially early in the course. You can have peer mentoring. So you can have students who are struggling with science writing. I know a lot of students who do science writing, they're like, I can't believe there's writing in science. So you can have them discuss those types of uh, things and and how to come up with answers to write their science work better. We had visits from uh, counseling services with Jason Murray coming and talking about the growth mindset to students and to professors. And that was very helpful. You can also look to the future and, and get older students or people who've already graduated and are in the working world and have them come and talk to students about how they can transition as well to the outside world. So the university stresses us out 
But that's not necessarily a bad thing. Because you see, if you have too little stress, you're not really learning. You're not pushing yourself out of that comfort zone and going on to that heroic journey. If you're too stressed, you're overwhelmed, it's persisting for too long, that's when stress becomes a problem. That's why it's very important to build a campus community that functions as a social network. And a pathway through building that community is adjusting your syllabus a little bit to invite other organizations from campus to help you build a more collaborative and cooperative learning atmosphere that can help students and professors. And so professors also have this issue too. Sometimes they, they feel a certain stigma about asking for help from CTL. But if you have that call to adventure to teach and you need to teach and you, and you treat it as a sort of adventure of learning, you can consult with people at CTL, reach out and find ways to collaborate on your journey so that you can make the University of Alberta the University of Adventure. And don't face that call to adventure alone. Thank you very much.